morning. I'm going to enjoy this $9 bottle of water. Last night, I flew in from San Diego. I arrived about 11.30 at night. And only in Vegas do you arrive somewhere to a hotel at, at 11.30 and the place is just booming. It's jumping. There's people everywhere and there's a line to check in. You go anywhere else in the world and you're like, uh, thank gosh, I'm finally here. Nobody's in the hotel. Get to your room. And then you got the 45 minute walk to your room. Gotta love Vegas. But the reason I, I, I shared about my $9 bottle of water is if you guys are staying here, you get to the room and, and they have that little scale in the room, right? And you pick up the water and, and like that you have a room charge. So this morning I checked out, I didn't know it was $9. Um, I mean, I figured it would be expensive because water is a, they ration the water here, the booze is much cheaper. Um, but as soon as I picked that thing up off the scale, it occurred to me as I'm coming here to talk about automation that I just experienced a little automation in my everyday life. This bottle of water, then that $9 charge, happened because I picked it up, a scale went off, it triggered a result to the back end ERP system and told them, hey, we're gonna bill this guy nine bucks and he's gonna pay it because, well, that's the rule. Once you pick that thing up, you own it, right? You guys know how that works? So don't ever pick that stuff up if you don't want it. It can be a very, very expensive night. Now, maybe the funnier thing about it all is it got me kind of thinking about how automation affects us and how it's part of our everyday life. And sometimes you don't think about the way technology is around us, right? There was a time when the cell phone was a big deal. You had like a, a, a bag, right? You'd carry the bag around or, or you'd have that giant brick phone and it was very present in our life. And now we still call it a cell phone, but you guys know that the phone is one of the least used applications on most people's smart device, right? Well, automation, unlike a phone, and unlike so many other technologies that we actually do interact with, is one of those things that we don't really see. And you guys are in the business, so you're thinking about it, you're seeing it around you. You probably noticed that the way that automation I just described worked, but the majority of people don't. And I thought that was really interesting. So I started thinking about things I wish were automated, and then maybe a few things I wish weren't automated. Like for instance, I thought, if somehow I could turn the chicken nuggets and macaroni and cheese that I get with my wife and kids at night into a steak and potatoes through automation, that would be a really, really cool way for automation to work. Or if I could get my awesome 16-year-old daughter who helps put away laundry to know that socks should match when she puts them into um, my drawers. You know, she's very helpful, but it wasn't until I got here I realized that she missed the mark there. Could automation fix that? Of course not, not really. But automation, of course, does make a big contribution to our life every day. It contributes to our businesses. It contributes to our bottom lines. And as consumers, which is really core to our digital transformation, it contributes to the experiences that we have every day in our lives. Now, I wanna talk a little bit about future proofing today. And I kinda of wanna set the stage about this. So I've written six books, okay? My most recent book is called Future Proof. And I'm gonna take you back in time in a minute before I take you to how I landed at Future Proof. But the rest of this presentation, I wanna kinda of do it two ways. So my focus in my work isn't just automation. My focus is digital transformation as a whole. So I research and I've commissioned studies for dozens of the world's largest organizations to understand how digital transformation is changing the way we work, the way we live, and the way we communicate. When CA and Atomic, and now CA's automation group, called me and asked me about this presentation, that was the first thing I said. Well, I'm not an automation expert. I said, but I am a technology and a digital transformation expert, and I talk about this all the time. And so we ended up challenging each other. It was kind of an interesting little debate that went back and forth. They said, well, we need this to be about automation. And I said, well, I just wrote Future Proof. This book just published. And by the way, there's like 400 copies back there. So when they're, when they're done, I'm going to sit there and sign books for you guys until my hands bleed. Assuming you still want it after you've listened to the rest of this presentation. But um, before you know, doing this, I said, Future Proof is a whole, it's a framework for digital transformation. 
I said, so what I want to do is I want to challenge you guys to help me wrap automation, one particular technology subset around this entire future-proof concept. And I'll tell you more about that in just a few minutes. Before Future Proof came out, the first book in the series was called Building Dragons. Have any of you guys heard of this concept of the, the unicorn, the unicorn company? Okay, so that's why I always ask. Sometimes I'm really assumptive in tech world that everyone's heard the unicorn. The unicorn is the company that achieves a billion dollar valuation, oftentimes prior to even, even creating any revenue, right? The unicorn is the company that many of our millennial and Gen Z children <laughs> think is going to be the way to riches. They've seen Google, and they've seen Facebook, they've seen Uber, and they've seen these companies basically out of a garage, of a basement. By the way, why is it always a garage? Has anyone thought about that? Like no one ever did it in a spare bedroom? <laughs> I swear though that that's just Hollywood. But why is it that they've defined that these companies are the route, they're the way, and they're the only ones that'll ever be successful? when so many companies achieve success in different ways. So building dragons actually became the framework for this whole digital transformation methodology where the only companies that can be successful don't have to be unicorns. They don't have to be companies achieving these absurd valuations well before they've actually accomplished anything, but that every company that's been contributing has the opportunity to transform themselves into what we define as a dragon. And the idea of the dragon is kind of the fact that it's not only a mythical, but that they shed their scales, right? They shed their skins and they rebirth. And so many companies that are going through this transformation right now are really going through this process. They are almost rebirthing themselves as totally different organizations. And if you think back to many of the big tech, but also just companies across every industry who have come out as winners in the past five and 10 years, who were around 50 years ago, they are nothing like the company they were. Nothing. Think about the companies like the GEs and the IBMs. Anyone bought a laptop from IBM? Mainframe? Not lately though, because they don't sell them. But that's what most adults think of when they think of that company. And now they're mostly a services company. They've sh shedded their scales and rebirthed themselves as a totally different organization. And this is why we believe holistically and overall in the market that the dragon is really the winner and the dragon is the most opportunistic. So yes, there is that one in a billion chance that one of you or that somebody you know will start a company that will become worth a billion dollars, that will get huge venture capital, that will be all over the news. But for many companies that are doing five million, 50 million or a hundred million dollars in revenue that have a hundred employees, a thousand employees right now, or even just a small business with 10 or 20 employees doing consulting services, the methodology to digitally transform is available and it's there, but it's all about how you build your business to be able to change and transform and use technology to your advantage. So when we basically wrote that, we were kind of looking for this whole unicorn versus dragon concept. Are all companies right now that are successful truly doing it in this you know, mass adoption first, money later methodology? And, and the truth was they weren't. They weren't doing that at all. What we found is companies that were adapting and changing fast, that were able to understand and innovate quickly and understand what innovation means to their market and to their customer, those were the companies that were coming out of this digital transformation and doing so very successfully. And it's really all based around this very idea. And to, to put it another way, and it is a little bit cliche, but I'm okay with that. I'm a, I'm a keynote speaker, right? We're full of cliches because I got to give you something to tweet. But you'll hear this is that change today is as fast as it's ever been or as slow as it's ever gonna be. And in technology, that is emphatically true. However fast it's moving today, I ascertain you that it's only gonna get faster. And so while we wrote Building Dragons and it gave us this framework for digital transformation, we ran into a problem. As we were writing the book, we realized we wanted to write a book about cloud, big data, automation, AI, virtual reality, you know, you name it, blockchain. And we said, well, first we got to talk about a couple things. We got to talk about adaptability. We got to talk about leadership. We got to talk about culture. And we got completely sidetracked. So 
if you ever pick up a copy of that, because that's not the one I have here, you'll find out that the first like nine chapters of the book are all about leadership and culture. And then if you want to digitally transform, you actually have to fundamentally change the way you think about your business, the way you lead your people, the way you tell your story. All that has to change first. And then the technology layer becomes really easy and it becomes super valuable in that continued transformation. I always make it easy. Think of it this way. Digital is tech. Transformation is people. And it's at least half, and mo most often it's far more. So what really must come next is we have to reframe the thinking. And the thinking is we need to future-proof. Again, cliche, maybe. Help me sell more books, yes. But the bottom line is we wanted to understand what are the commonalities between all of the companies that are successfully achieving digital transformation. And I'll note this in advance. You are never done transforming. And I think you guys get this, right? Not heads, everybody understands. It's not like you're doing a digital transformation and on Friday you're done. It's like a website, right? It's never finished. And that's how transformation is going to be. So just to kind of share with you how we defined future proof, since I don't think it's fully been uh, embraced by the Webster yet, but if the book does well enough, it will be. So when we finally got to the framework, and I'm about to get to the part where we're really gonna dive into the automation, we basically came up with seven. And the methodology behind the seven was we were looking for what are those commonalities. Now, of course, every company has certain things that are totally unique to them. And there's always an example. So we researched hundreds of different companies, big and small, in tech, not in tech, to try to understand you know, whether it would be Nike, Disney, Netflix, right, Amazon. We were looking at all these companies that are all the pillars, and by the way, they're the ones that are always talked about on stage. And that's okay because it's more relatable. Um, I found out a long time ago talking about obscure companies actually doesn't do that well in front of a crowd. They're just like, who are you talking about? We don't, we don't get it. So um, <laughs> I actually got into talking about the Netflixes and Amazons more because people just relate, which by the way, storytelling, right? But the methodology then the seven came down to, we were looking for those seven commonalities and one more thing to note, not one company, no matter how successful they had been with their transformation, are, are doing all seven of these well. Okay, so as I go through these and I talk about them, don't immediately feel that pressure that if you're not doing all these things well, many of the companies are only doing two or three very well, but that two or three is giving them the, the, the momentum that they need to carry forward. And what we hope is that they'll look at the other three or four and start to figure out ways to apply them and add them into their business strategy. And I'm gonna introduce them real quickly. So we talk about experience. We talk about people. We talk about change. We talk about innovation, leadership, technology, and culture. And these things all do tie together, okay? But they aren't dependent in all cases on one another. You can have a business that's very experience focused that doesn't change that well. You can have a business that's great with technology that doesn't do a good job with its people. So we need to make sure we keep that in mind as we go forward. Now, when I talk about each one of these, I'm gonna briefly talk about them in the context of digital transformation. And then, as I promised you, I challenged CA to give me some specific examples, and I did a little back study on these different examples of where automation was then applied to help a company in executing each of the particular seven pillars of digital transformation. So, the first one is experience. And experience in a holistic standard, and you're seeing, by the way, have you guys seen those awesome signs all over this place with the great stats. There's these great signs, like 53% of large enterprises are going to compete on experience primarily within two years. I'm an analyst, so I love data, but I also love good tweetables, and that has actually been both for me. But experience is definitely one of the things that we found companies that are winning are doing. How many people have been to Disney? Right? Almost everybody's here. Does anybody not like Disney in this room? Well, anybody? You know, okay. So you're the one. And, and actually, I'll be fair. Personally, it's not like my idea. But if you're a family person, like you cannot not like Disney. 
And it's, Disney is one of those companies that understands experiences and has for 100 years. Long before technology was ever part of the experience creation process, Disney just always understood. They have two rules. Disney has two rules when it comes to their employees in their company. The first rule is to create magic. The second rule is to pick up the trash. Some of you may have heard this before, but I like sharing this when I talk about experiences because this to me is one of the, it's the absolute perfect example of how a company can do something very simple to create an experience that is going to be meaningful, right? Why pick up the trash? Nobody wants to go to a dirty, disgusting park. And I'll say, there's other companies that have awesome theme parks with rides that I would say are much, much better than what Disney has ever created. I'll say that, I feel good about saying that. But they've never been as popular, they've never been as profitable because they've never had the same experience focus. Now, before data and analytics, by the way, this goes way back, right? So now it's pretty easy, you put cameras all over the park, you use machine learning, you look at people, you figure out where you need to locate trash cans, right? But Disney, actually, before all that technology was available, wanted to create this great clean park experience. You know what they did? They put their employees in the middle of the park. They had them watch people all day long, go to the concession stand and pick up a hot dog, okay? These people would buy a hot dog and then the counters would have a little clipboard in their hand and they would watch how many steps the consumer took between the time they finished their hot dog and the time they littered on the, on the park. And then they actually measured that over a period of time, created a large enough sample set to say 25 steps. Every 25 steps, we need to put a garbage can because if we make people walk more than 25 cents after buying a $14 hot dog with their $9 bottle of water, they're gonna throw trash on the ground. If they throw trash on the ground, the park gets dirty. If the park gets dirty, people don't wanna pay $250 for a day pass to ride on mediocre rides, right? You're paying so that when your daughter walks into the restaurant, the princess knows her name, walks up to her, gives her a hug, they serve them the meal that they love, the kid's eyes light up, the pictures go on Facebook, you get that adrenaline rush of likes that come with every time you post something, right? And the series goes on and on. And by the way, lots of automation littered throughout what Disney does. But I wanna talk about an example that I got when I partnered up with CA as well. And they introduced me to, this, to AMC theaters, the movies. Talk about an experience business, right? the experience of going to the movies. Well, in the last few years, the experience has changed, and later on I'll talk about a company that's actually participated in the change of the experience of going to the movies. But people still wanna go out, they still wanna leave their house. That's why the malls or retail stores still exist. Otherwise, e-commerce would have finished that a long time ago. People still like the experience, they still want Dolby Surround, they wanna hear that loud movie, and they wanna be the first to see it. And at this point, that's the way you do it. AMC was trying to figure out how can we add technology, how do we add automation to transform an experience. Well, what if it could use social media, say Twitter and say Facebook, to automate notifications of specials, give someone a, a, a discount on their popcorn and their drink because it knows you're in the movie theater and it knows that you're part of the ecosystem and it can automate just because you showed up and actually take you through a process, give you a, a special discount and create a new and better experience. We all know how expensive that stuff is at the theater, but personalization is a huge part of transformation. There's no way that the theater there could actually do this manually. There's no way that you could show up, what are you gonna do, hand everybody a coupon? Well, the thing is, is one person may like popcorn, the next person may like nachos, the next person may want a pretzel, and the other guy may like Sour Patch Kids. Well, with automation, it can start to actually customize those offers, and that's exactly what's being done. And as automation is added to things like AI and machine learning, those offers can be more and more tailored and customized to say, holy crap, this theater, this company really knows me well. And they've connected my online experience to my real world experience. You guys hear omni-channel, right? They've created a full omni-channel experience and they've used automation at the core of it. So let's talk about the people side of things. I'm one of those people that emphatically talks about people being the most important part of every company. Uh, the next book I'm writing is actually called The Human-Machine Partnership. 
and I am exploring this very topic of how people and machines will work together. Being in the automation space, right, we hear all the time, we're people are scared, right? People are like, is that robot gonna take my job, right? They see this, the, the cyborg up in, uh, you know, Boston Scientific up there, you know, that's picking up packages and moving them onto shelves. I mean, it's scary. It's a little ways away, but it's happening. But at the core of most great businesses are people. And we think about where can people help change a business. So the retail space is, 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 an, is a example I always like to give. You guys ever shop at, at, um, at Nordstrom? Maybe not. But high-end retail is a really, really tough place to be right now um, because of the internet. So companies are trying to think about how do we make something more personal? Well, if you shop at these stores, at the, at the high-end store like Nordstrom, what happens is when you buy, you ever go to the register, they don't just throw the stuff over the counter at you. It's a very, very personalized and tailored experience that this company has been doing for many, many years. They walk around the register. They shake your hand, they hand you the bag. You ask them where the bathroom is. They're trained to actually walk you and guide you to the bathroom. People are being invested in heavily in these companies. And by the way, their sales people and retail can make a six figure salary. It's unbelievable in this day and age. But they understand that in their case, while they are implementing new technologies, they are trying to add machine learning, they are trying to add AI into their automation of recommendations into their business, they are still known as a premium product that creates a premium experience and their people are the delivery of that premium experience. So they've made that a priority in their business. This isn't limited to just a couple of retail stores. When I asked for an example from CA, unfortunately I couldn't name the name, but they told me about a case of banking in the Nordics. And this banking example that was really interesting to me was a company that was facing this very challenge. They said, we want our people to be able to do things that matter, right? We don't need, you know, you think about in the hotel, right? The scale, you take the water off, it bills me. How is that done when there's not a scale and there's not automation? The room service people have to go into the room, pick up the tickets and deliver it. And guess what? That's not a really a foolproof system, is it? You know, so you get a bill on your thing for that water, which by the way shows up three days later, right? And it's all kinds of added work. Well, it's the same thing in many, many knowledge industries too. You have your people spending a lot of time doing tasks that aren't making you money, that aren't making them happy, and that aren't really applicable in a day where automation can change that. So this particular bank looked at that and said, every process inside of our organization that we can automate to take the menial tasks away, not to replace people, when we talk about leadership, we'll talk a little more about that, but to give the people an opportunity to focus more on doing things that matter, that are strategic, whether that's working closer to customers, coming up with ideas for new marketing strategies, building and deploying on mobile. But the focus was getting them away from these processes. And this theme will carry on through the rest of the trends. From a standpoint of the third pillar, which is change, there's probably one thing that everybody here struggles with. You know, there's an old saying, the only thing people like less than everything staying the same is change. People are extremely uncomfortable with change. And you see it every time you try to deploy new technology in your business. You see it every time you change a policy in your business. You tell people, hey, we're going to do a new method of, of expense reports. And your sales guys lose their freaking minds. You're like, oh my God, I can't just do, a, do an Excel anymore? You want me to use this software? It's going to take me forever. And you'll have two years of complaining and then people will finally eventually come around to it and they'll do it. And then you'll tell them about the next thing and they'll act like change is just this unmanageable, unfathomable fathomable thing. So interestingly enough though, when I brought up the concept of, of change, I had a chance to talk to the CMO of Atomic who's now the CMO of uh, CA's automation business. And I asked him for a great example of using change to drive digital transformation in their business. And since I'm here and he's here, what I said is, why don't you come up and tell the story and give these people a break from listening to me? So I'd like to introduce Chris Borman really quickly. Thank Chris, you. Chris, thanks for joining me real quick. Okay. He told me this about five minutes ago, by the way. <laughs> it was very ad hoc. We are an agile exactly. speaking team. And actually, um, the change that I wanted to mention was the change we've gone through from our own engineering point of view. Um, because 
our engineering organization, uh, and I think this is a phenomenal testament to what the automation or formerly Automic team have done. And the, the way in which we used to build our technology was a very traditional way of um, engineering organization, waterfall methodologies, um, delivering technology on a periodic basis. What they did over the last few years is completely change how they are leveraging technology and culture and processes to um, improve and change the way in which they deliver code. And one of the things that I find amazing as a marketeer is that our engineering organization now delivers bi-weekly or every two weeks um, upgrades into our own internal production system running salesforce.com and ServiceNow to actually allow us to basically use that technology. And that change has been a profound change in how we develop our own technology. And there's a gentleman by the name of Christopher Heil who, be, who will be presenting all of the things that have actually taken place in the next presentation after this one. Because it's a, I think it's a really, really good example of changing the way in which you code leveraging agile methodologies, and it's all about culture. It's all about process as well as the technology itself. Hey, don't steal my thunder, but, but before you run off stage, Chris, and thank you for sharing that, by the way, you told me one more thing that this change enabled for your company, and this is something every company is always thinking about. It's an exit. The change you made in your company did not only make you guys faster and help drive your transformation, it also made you more attractive and helped move your acquisition through with, with CA, yes? Yep, absolutely, and it's one of those things where um, I think what CA saw, I think, is um, the, the innovation that, that is coming through in that engineering environment and the way in which we've been embracing business process automation, cloud automation, was very appealing, and that's part of that process, I think. So yeah, thanks. Chris, thank you so much. Thanks, All right, everybody, give him a little round of applause. I figure you guys get stuck from like 8 a.m., 8.30 a.m. listening to people speak. It's like you'd like to hear a different voice for just a minute. So now you're stuck with me again, but don't worry. There's only about, I don't know, 18 more minutes. But let's jump forward really quickly to the fourth trend. The fourth, I guess I'll call it a pillar. I, I like trends, but pillar is really the right word. Automation and innovation. But first, innovation. Now, one of the biggest problems with innovation is, it, is there's a definition problem, right? Every company kind of struggles, what is innovation? Innovation from a macro perspective, innovation from a disruption perspective, innovation from a, a small um, inter intermediate step forward transformation in a company, or even innovation that is sometimes confused as iteration, right? Sometimes companies just change things little bits. They call it innovation, but really all they're doing is iterating on what they're already doing. And sometimes, by the way, that's okay. But innovation and the companies that are winning, the companies that are succeeding in digital transformation, they're all innovating. Um, and we kind of innovate around this, this, this one concept of failing fast to succeed sooner. And we talk about this a lot throughout the book, but you guys probably have heard that concept, like fail fast, and it's kind of cliche. Like, again, I got these cliches, and what I try to do is I try to break through the cliche and actually make it make sense to people. When someone says fail fast, nobody actually means to fail, okay? I want to be very clear about that. Nobody means like, go ahead and lose a million bucks. It's a great idea, okay? What they're really saying is that Every time you deploy, so we talked about that new expense reporting system, right? You deploy that system and you know what sort of benefit you're expecting, right? You have a strategy, you have an expectation and an outcome that you already determined before you bought that solution. How do you actually figure out if you're on track and if that solution is going to bomb, if people are absolutely not going to use it, if it's going to cause upheaval and it's going to unroot the company and you don't have the culture to make that change, how do you get out and get on to the next thing? That's fast fail. Fast fail might be a design fast fail. Companies like um, Deso System, I say it with a French accent because they're French. They design um, virtualization, visualization software. You know, so they work with the companies like Trek Bicycles, right? Well, if you're a manufacturer of a bicycle in today's age and you want to make sure before you sell someone, you know, people spend like $10,000 on their bicycles. If you want to spend $10,000 on a bicycle, don't you want to make sure that thing's been run through the mill and the tests? Well, companies can't put out new bikes regularly if they have to have them out in testing for one or two years. They can't embrace the newest technology, make the lightest bicycles, use the, the most you know, progressive materials and help their riders have the best experience. 
But what if you could simulate that entire experience? What if you could visually design a bicycle, run it through all the pace testing, do it at exponential speeds, and launch new products in a third or half the amount of time that you would be able to do it traditionally? This is available right now and today. So beyond fast fail from a standpoint of maybe a single operation or procedure inside your business, companies are also fast failing with products and design. There's companies that specialize this. One uh, toy manufacturer went to a company called Idio, and they said that we want to transform how we do innovation in our company. Innovation was a closed lab process. They had a few people designing new toys. Some of their toys were working, some of their toys were flopping. They couldn't figure out why, didn't have the data. What if we could have more ideas, we could test the ideas quicker through rapid prototyping, using data analytics, machine learning, AI, and then ultimately determine which products would work? Very interesting, right? So they did this, figured out a thousand ideas, ran a thousand ideas through their te testing methodology, okay? Guess how many? Anyone want to take a guess how many of their thousand ideas were deemed successful? Yeah, I heard zero and 500. 37. 37 ideas, 3.7%. So if you have two engineers in lab coats in a lab coming up with two, five, seven, eight ideas a year, your batting average is 3.7%. They changed the process, they created an innovation process, but they're not the only company. Let's talk about this company who used automation to innovate their business. Everybody here probably uses Netflix. I downloaded two movies, I'll be watching them on my flight home that I'll be taking right after I sign these books, okay? And by the way, we love Netflix, most people do. They're pricing stuff, maybe it's a little, but they've completely changed. Go back to the AMC conversation, they've reimagined how we consume content in movies. They absolutely have changed the way we consume movies. Who would have ever thought that your five inch screen that you, some of you are looking at right now and not to take pictures and tweet would become your movie watching method? Who really thought that? Who really thought that was gonna be it? Five years back, nobody thought that. Three years ago, people started to think it. And now it's like, you know, the biggest challenge for AMC, going back to their story is they're limited to only those people that really care about that movie experience now. They don't have that same crowd because everyone's like, I'll just wait for Netflix. Right? But Netflix isn't just creating awesome because they have a lot of movies in a library. There were actually technologies for a long time that put movies in a library. Netflix was awesome because they have recommendation engines, they have personalization in their systems, and automation is helping them do this. How do you think it gets to the point where it really knows you and your movies and which ones like you and which ones you like? That happened with a lot of technology and a lot of automation. So you sign in, you've got all your family members, those cool little emoji faces, you pick yourself, it knows what show you like, it knows what show you might like. That is a wonderful experience. That's innovation. That's innovation happening. And Netflix is not only a great example for that particular thing they've done, Netflix has been innovating since the very beginning. They've been extremely disruptive. Sure, it's an example that's used over and over again because it's a great one. All right. We'll talk about leadership here. So circling back, I started with people and people always go, well, people and leadership, how are they different? Well, when we study the idea of future-proofing your business, the companies that are succeeding with future-proofing have leaders that are, we call them risk takers and rule breakers, okay? Almost every company that is turning a corner that has made a major comeback, their leaders have had to make really, really tough decisions. Okay, so when we talked about the people thing and we talked about the banking, com the banking company in Nordics that, that got all their people redirected to other things, well, there's also harder decisions going on right now. Leaders right now are going to have to transform and take people potentially out of picture, right? When autonomous trucks come in and you don't need drivers and trucks and they can increase safety, lower, uh, lower insurance rates, drivers are going to be in trouble. It's not, it's not because these company operators are heartless and soulless. It's because there's gonna be regulatory requirements that they're gonna use these trucks. It's gonna be safer on the road. It's gonna get things to places more efficiently and it's gonna be the only way they stay in business. Leadership inside of transformation right now, people are making those hard decisions and not all of them are hard in a bad way. Some of them are hard by moving into new product categories, completely going away from what has worked for them. We're seeing this in tech every single day. Companies taking major risks. So CA shared an example with me of a company called Genworth. And this one was really interesting to me. And the reason I put it into the bucket of leadership 
for automation. And the reason I thought it was so interesting was they had a process at the end of the month. They're a major financial company, right? If you're closing out your books at the end of the month, okay, and you work for a company, usually that can take 15 days, 30 days, right? You're getting your, your data together to report your numbers. It can take a while. Not with automation, though. They had 1,300 disparate processes at the end of the month that their team of engineers, accountants, analysts had to come in, work the weekend from literally that Friday to Sunday night so that Monday morning when they had to have that month closed would be done. There's an easy button for that. And that was this great example of automation. They took 1,300 processes down to something at 5 p.m. on a Friday. They pushed the easy button. And by Saturday morning, the system had run through all of these 1,300 processes using automation, finalizing those reports. And guess what? Those people got back their weekends. But from a leadership standpoint, it also meant some of those menial tasks, some of those menial jobs had to go away. The company had to make those decisions, right? We can't continue to have those people in those roles, but we also can't continue to avoid using technology where it helps our business break through, be more efficient, simply because that one reason. It's a, it's a risk and it's hard, but the leaders that are transforming are making those hard decisions every day. And the sixth pillar is technology. Now we've been talking about technology this whole time. And that's what people always like, well, why is it only one pillar if it's digital transformation, it's technology, and why did it take you so long to get to tech? Well, if you think about it, right, every single example I've given has been littered with technology. You're not driving change. CA's change, or atomics change, came from the utilization of automation within their own business. AMC's experience is coming from the utilization of social, big data, analytics, automation. So tech is littered throughout this, but tech as a core principle is also very, very important. So the utilization, companies that are effectively creating digital cores, okay, are overwhelmingly having more success with their digital transformation, and this is the tech part of it, right? Companies that are actually ready today, you know, a lot of companies are still having conversations about topics like mobile and cloud. But the companies that have these digital cores, these companies that are already moving into blockchain, they're already moving into advanced analytics and automation. They're already moving into artificial intelligence as a, as a mean. And this isn't only large companies. These technologies are available. There are thousands of companies creating as a service for technologies like blockchain. But the utilization and having this be core to your business is more and more rare than ever before. And so asking for the automation example for this one was a little bit harder because automation is technology. So getting deeper into this, I was given the example, and I thought this was very interesting, of Task. Now, Task, this company was focusing on moving from a premise-based, hardware-based solution to actually moving and migrating everything to the cloud. And that hasn't happened yet. But the reason I thought this was very interesting was their processes were just very, very slow. So a little bit like the CA process, they weren't able to get things done very efficiently. They were using more antiquated technology and they want to move to web services, so Amazon Web Services. So they were able to use the help, partner with a company like CA to take a number of these processes, right, these manual processes and actually put them through automation. And this gave them the ability to go cloud which cloud was a step forward in them going to a digital core. It's very, very hard using old premise-based technology to build a digital core right now when you need a very agile, very adaptable system, just like you need very agile and very adaptable people. And this, this takes me to the last one. And this one I want to spend just a little bit of extra time on, culture. I asked for an example about culture, and it was very, very hard. And I'll come back to why that is in a second. But overwhelmingly, when I look at the seven pillars, right, you have experience, people change, and then you have innovation, leadership, technology. Culture is like this massive pillar that sits right in the middle of every organization, okay? Culture is at the core of every single company, good or bad. Every one of you can go home and ask yourself the question, what kind of culture is our company? Do people believe in leadership 
of our business? Do people believe in the ideas of our CEOs and executives in the company? And that, that philosophical culture, even culture is even, you know, people that take longer coffee breaks and companies that let it happen. Culture are lots of little pieces. It's the stories that are told in every sales meeting, right? You have the sales guys, and some of them come up with their one example that's from their own experience, but they've got those, those examples from history of where your company did major great things, and it comes up in every single sales meeting. That's culture. But culture is really what makes and allows for all the things to happen inside of your digital transformation. If you have a business that has a culture that doesn't want to change, how easy is it to change anything? Now, of course, if all of you guys have great cultures, you may not have experienced this, but like myself having, you know, before I, I went on my own, launched my own firm, I worked for companies that were turnaround companies. I worked for companies that were family owned businesses that had deeply rooted values and beliefs about culture and about how they treated people and about change. And getting new ideas done, getting a new CRM deployed was almost impossible. You hear all the time, you'll hear like 50% of IT projects fail. That stat is out there. Does that not, in being in the technology, does that not blow your mind that half of technology projects fail? Do you think the integrators and the technology is bad half the time? I think you would all agree with me that it's not a 50%. And in fact, I always say this. When we did this study, we had people utilizing technologies that are often seen as second class or second rate to what's best of breed in a category of cloud, in a category of mobile, in a category of big data. And they were having more success transforming. Why was that? Their culture was stronger than their competitors. And when your culture is stronger, you can take the seventh best technology and make it more effective and usable inside of your organization than the company with a rough culture that's invested in the highest priced, most acclaimed technologies. People, change, innovation, technology, leadership, experiences. These things coming together are the catalysts of building culture. And the culture is the catalyst for building change. So whether it's Netflix being more innovative, they're not only innovative because they have great technology and ideas, they're innovative because they have culture. You'll hear stories going back about their hiring and about how they decided on people and how every year people re-interviewed for their jobs were given promotions and opportunities to grow in their company by a very different approach to HR. You could say that's good or that's bad, but that became inherent in their culture. Genworth, their leadership believed in a culture of embracing new technologies, even if it meant taking risks and changing personnel. That leadership impacts culture. And some of these other companies, you're going to have to wait and see. Companies like an AMC, where they have major challenges in terms of the market and the desire to maybe attend films, but they're thinking outside the box about applying automation about utilizing technology and changing and bringing back the experience. And I've said this a long time about retail, and I've, I've been asked often when I'm doing interviews and stuff about my predictions on retail. I think retail will actually have a renaissance, but it's not until retail is reimagined with what's possible because of technology. So as I sit, and I thought about this this morning, I said, you know, the automation for my $9 bottle of water and the automation that I wish I had when my daughter didn't match my socks, which by the way, I'm playing this off as it's pretty cool, right? Not wearing, not wearing matching socks. But what I did really realize is that while I often preach this concept that not one technology itself can digitally transform a company, that it is certainly possible with every single technology, including automation, to consider how it can help your company transform, how it can drive experiences, lead people, and change, innovation, leadership, culture, technology. It can do it all. Automation can help future-proof your business, and you can future-proof your business with automation. Thank you guys very much for your time today.